wanted to welcome everybody to this morning's webinar session. We're going to be talking about energy storage and have a stellar lineup prepared. Clint Wilder, Clean Edge's senior editor, is going to be moderating today's discussion. But before I hand the floor over to Clint, I wanted to just tackle a few housekeeping notes. All the participants here are in listen-only mode, which means there's not going to be a discussion among the panelists and our audience. But we do have a great tool here in the GoToWebinar system, and we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you are unfamiliar with the application, what you need to do is just click the drop down for the questions box and enter any comments or questions that you have, and we'll be able to field as many of those as possible during the session today. So we'll, we'll, per, 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 we'll offer a few other opportunities and reminders to submit those, but please start as soon as you're interested um, providing us questions. We'll be moderating and sending those over the panel today during the discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Clint Wilder, uh, as I said, Clean Edge's senior editor and author of Clean Tech Nation, and he's going to be moderating today's session. Clint? Okay, thanks very much, Bryce. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone, depending on where you are. I know we have uh, some participants from other countries, so special welcome to you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today for what we expect to be a lively discussion of a very hot topic in energy right now, unleashing the mass deployment of energy storage. And we're fortunate to have a terrific lineup of speakers today who are all pretty much completely immersed in this topic every day. Uh, Bob Rudd is Director of Project Development at Solar City. Conrad Eustis is Director of Retail Technology Strategy at Portland General Electric in Oregon. Bob Fleischman, our second Bob, is a Senior of Counsel at the law firm of Morrison and & Forster. And Tom Stepien is CEO of Primus Power, a fast-growing battery startup in Hayward, California. So uh, just briefly, the way it, things will work today, our agenda, uh, I'll set the stage briefly and pose an initial question to each panelist. Then we'll have a uh, moderated discussion with all four of the panelists. And then near the end, we will take your audience, audience questions. So as Bryce said, please submit those anytime during the session by typing them in the chat box on your screen. So just a few key recent developments uh, to set the stage in storage. Uh, as most of you know, last year, California issued the nation's first energy storage mandate, requiring the state's three investor-owned utilities to collectively buy 1.3 gigawatts of storage capacity by 2020, and also noting that it, should, it must be cost-effective, another challenge. Uh, major players like uh, Tesla, Solar City and SunPower uh, are aggressively entering the storage business. We'll hear about that from Bob Rudd in a moment. Utility scale storage is rapidly moving from pilot projects to major deployments. Uh, many megawatts already online, hundreds more in the RFQ pipeline, and costs are coming down. And the growth of distributed storage, not unlike the growth of distributed generation, poses big challenges for utilities and regulators. And just some recent headlines making the news. I've heard about the uh, gigafactory that Tesla is uh, planning to build in the United States very soon, and uh, some, some other headlines there. So uh, let's jump right in, and I want to uh, first uh, thank our co-host of today's session, Morrison and Forster. It's the law firm with one of the lead, with one of the world's leading energy practices, with strong expertise in the legal and regulatory issues around energy storage. You can learn more about them at their website, mofo.com. So let's get right into it. Kick things off with uh, Bob Rudd from Solar City. Uh, Bob, Solar City is at the nexus of key trends in clean energy today: the massive, rapid growth of solar PV and the move to distributed generation. What's the role of storage in the company's strategy moving forward, uh, both in terms of customer grid independence and uh, integration with the grid? Sure, thank you very much. Um, first off, I think just to sort of address uh, one of the points you made in terms of customer grid independence, um, it, it really is our intention to, uh, to maintain all of our PV customers 
uh, and our PV Plus battery customers connected to the grid and being a, a real integral part of the grid. Um, our CTO, Pete Rive, has recently uh, written a blog post to that effect, basically saying that, you know, it's not our intention to sort of disconnect folks from the grid. Uh, quite the opposite. We want to use PV and batteries to become, you know, more of a functional part of the grid. So um, with that said, you know, where storage plays into our sort of current platform here, uh, I can't release the specific numbers, but we've got project numbers in the hundreds in California uh, across the residential and commercial sector uh, based on our sort of current platform, which for residential customers is a uh, backup power option that, that comes in the form of a lease. And uh, for commercial customers is, is really demand charge reductions uh, for battery projects that are installed in conjunction with PV. Uh, now I know there's been a lot of press recently about our activities uh, with the IOUs in terms of interconnecting uh, projects in, the, in California. Um, and really, you know, I think that is a result of us being on the front lines of, of going through these uh, first learning curves of interconnecting batteries in conjunction with PV. Um, I just want to clarify that, uh, you know, we're very much moving forward on all of these projects. Uh, the recent PUC ruling on, on interconnection has been uh, a huge win for us and, and uh, everything is full steam ahead. So just clarifying that because we get a lot of questions on that press release. Um, and, and in terms of long term, how storage plays into our strategy, uh, you know, eventually we see every PV system that we install having batteries added to it. Uh, you know, we're probably a number of years off from that, but ultimately to drive a broader adoption of PV uh, and, and distributed generation, we see it as necessary uh, when we come against net meter and caps and things of the like. Um, you know, and we see hardware transforming uh, over the long term as well. You know, these days you wouldn't call it a, a PV plus inverter system. It's all one functional unit. And as, um, you know, as the uh, battery inverter technologies advance, we see that uh, becoming the same and it all becoming, you know, one sort of, uh, PV generation system that just happens to have batteries uh, incorporated. Uh, to make that pencil, obviously, we're going to need to bring costs down and, and get some added revenue streams from the market. Um, I, that comes in a number of varieties, both from wholesale services available available uh, from, from the IOUs and the grid operators, um, as well as, you know, a, a additional uh, demand charge type reductions for commercial customers. Um, and really long term, we're focused on making the regulatory changes uh, at, in order to make all of that viable um, as soon as possible. Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Conrad, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, Bob, that's a great perspective on uh, <clears throat> customer side storage, both residential and commercial. But of course, utility scale storage is a, a big part of the picture here. So uh, Conrad, tell us uh, briefly what are the key storage projects underway at PGE? And how does the utility view storage from a cost perspective? So good morning slash afternoon, everybody. Um, so storage is uh, a very important opportunity for the entire Northwest um, United States, mainly because traditionally we've relied on hydro and as a reason to meet peak load. And without any peaking plants to speak of, as we bring renewables onto the grid, we really only have uh, hydro and or um, baseload plants in order to deal with the variation of renewable output. So uh, we have um, three projects that are underway right now. The most visible nationally has been our, um, it's a five megawatt system tied to our substation in Salem, Oregon. And that's a lithium ion battery. It's funded um, by ARA funds as part of the Pacific Northwest Smart Grid Demonstration Project. Um, it's not cost effective, but it's a multi-million dollar project. So it draws attention and it's, it's helping to transform the culture of our company and integrate our various departments, if you will. We're still a bit uh, vertically integrated utility. So we're all looking for the benefits that can serve each of the main um, traditional silos, if you will. The second is a small research project that we're doing with um, Portland State University on a concept of uh, a battery inverter or sort of microgrid tied in at the customer's meter. And in this instance, we use distributed storage at the customer site, but we 
control them together. The battery serves the customer if there's an outage, but for most of the time we're using it and commanding charges and discharges to serve um, cases such as peak demand response or we have excess renewable generation here in the Northwest in the June when the snow is melting. So that's another value plus just the firming of renewable resources. And finally, a project that um, I've been working on for a number of years because it's actually the cheapest uh, resource is thermal storage. The Northwest traditionally has a lot of water heaters. And so speaking for the Northwest, not just Portland General Electric, the 3.5 million water heaters represent a, a controllable, I mean, around the clock resource of 2,000 megawatts and at least 15,000 megawatt hours. And all of this is at a benefit cost ratio of essentially 10 to one compared to building a peaking plant. So this is way cheaper than storage and this benefit cost ratio even includes very significant incentives for customers to participate in the program. Very interesting. Uh, we'll definitely come back to some of that, but I want to uh, move on to uh, Bob Fleischman um, and uh, get get into some of the regulatory uh, stuff here. Um, so distributed storage, especially Bob, poses big new challenges for regulators. Uh, Bob Rudd referred to the PUC ruling on utility fees in California for on-site storage. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly get more into this as, as we move forward here, but w briefly tell us what are the current hot button regulatory issues in storage that, that you see? My pleasure. The issues play out both at the federal level in the United States and at the state level, and there's two issues at the federal level and three at the state that I'd like to briefly touch on. The first at the federal level is, as I'm sure many know, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, has been a big supporter of energy storage and has moved the ball forward in a number of ways, beginning in 2009 in the New York ISO, where they incorporated storage resources into the regulation market, then through uh, Order 755 and 784, and most recently with, this, with respect to its small interconnection uh, uh, procedures for uh, under 20 megawatts, Order 792. And the issues are first, will, how will FERC follow through on implementing these various policies in the RTOs and ISOs to ensure that the policies get effectuated? The so FERC has recently rejected a proposal uh, in uh, ISO New England on the basis with respect to its regulation market design because it failed in FERC's view to adequately take into account the operational characteristics of storage resources. The second question is, as President Obama has nominated uh, the current director of enforcement at FERC, Norman Bay, to be a new commissioner and to be uh, the chairman if he is confirmed, the question is, assuming uh, that he is confirmed, what will his priorities be and how will that impact storage. In his uh, responses to questions from the Senate Energy Committee, he has noted that his, his priorities include uh, permitting and incenting gas and electric infrastructure, improving the efficiency of competitive markets and delivering greater value to consumers, and then also focusing on reliability, both physical security and cybersecurity. So uh, as he, uh, assuming he becomes uh, the chairman of the agency, uh, a question will be, how will the energy storage agenda fare? At the state level, I think there are three questions, three hot button issues. The first is, how will California's energy storage mandate uh, play out? How successful it will it be as it moves from the mandate to the rulemaking process and now into the implementation and procurement plan stage? Uh, the second question uh, is uh, the interplay between uh, storage and distributed generation and the, the movement toward more distributed generation and how that's going to impact how the utilities will be compensated at the retail level and what kinds of policy changes will there be in related issues, things like net metering and renewable portfolio standards and the like. The third hot button issue uh, is playing out in New York at this point where there is a proposal to modernize the energy uh, infrastructure and uh, the New York Public Service Commission has a, a proposal to uh, look at the uh, role of the utilities on a going forward basis and uh, what is described as a distributed system platform provider role for V 
the utilities. And those are the key issues that we're seeing. And there are many other subsidiary issues, but those are some of the big ones. Very good. Lot, lots going on, obviously. And finally, uh, Tom Stepien, uh, Primus Power, kind of on the, the front lines of the, the business and the technology. Um, and, you know, for years, the, the biggest barrier to massive adoption of storage, particularly utility scale, has been cost. So what factors are driving down technology t costs today, and, uh, and are these trends accelerating? Good morning, good afternoon. So you're right. Historically, we have been challenged by cost because, frankly, it's been less expensive to use other alternatives, uh, and particularly here in the United States, gas peakers because the price of natural gas is, is quite low. I believe, however, we're at a tipping point. Costs have come down and technology has improved. Here in Silicon Valley, there's something like 75 different battery companies. Some are small for EVs, some are very large grid scale companies like Primus Power. At the end of the day, the metric that is most important and the one that uh, intelligent buyers uh, prescribe to is the total life cycle cost. And that takes into account all of the differences between the different batteries. There are a bunch of them out there. It takes into account capital cost, operating cost, whether you need to replace portions of your storage system over time, the land that the uh, battery will take up, even the financing uh, and the efficiency of the battery uh, are all captured by that. And we're at the point now, and uh, several companies like Primus are getting batteries on the grid, where these costs, total life cycle costs, make sense against those traditional alternatives. You know, I think of uh, these storage systems as a multifunction device, similar to your iPhone or your, your smartphone, right? You use it to, for standard communication, but you use it for directions, and to make restaurant reservations, to check your email. And batteries, compared to traditional generation, um, have those functions. They can give and absorb energy. Generation can just give energy. A well-designed storage system can install quickly, has, of course, uh, less emissions. You can move them uh, if you need that optionality. Uh, they have a capital cost that today is a little bit higher than traditional generation. But if you look at the O&M, you look at some of the other attributes, uh, and the, the real trick here is to stack the benefits. If you can reduce the demand charges, like uh, our Solar City friend mentioned they are doing, if you can manage the frequency, manage the voltage, if you can integrate renewables, those are all different value streams. And just like a multifunction device, those values add up and make it the right, uh, the right choice at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, great. Well, I want to uh, toss that back to Conrad in terms of the, the viewing the, the life cycle cost, as, as Tom says. Um, how does that uh, square with what you, how you guys at PG&E look at the, the cost equation? Um, so just to say there's no, there's no ampersand in Portland General Electric. <laughs> But, um, oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> common mistake, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, it is unfortunately a common mistake. Um, but no, I absolutely agree with life cycle cost. I mean, it is the only way that I do economic analysis of storage. And traditional sort of least cost planning that utilities have been doing for two decades is very much about looking at the life cycle costs from birth to death, including all the maintenance. So absolutely. I concur with life cycle approach. Okay, and I just also wanted to ask you, um, you know, a big focus today is on batteries, but uh, what do you think are, are the most promising technologies in storage over, say, the next five years? Uh, well, definitely water heaters. And like I mentioned, it, it yeah. has a benefit cost of 10 to 1 compared to building a peaking plant. And... The only thing that's, and these are new water heaters. Uh, I've been working with EPRI and some of the water heater manufacturers have been working with EPRI now for several years. And there's a standard interface um, spec, ANSI CEA 2045 is the number. But what it means is it's a, a standard communication interface, a socket, like a USB socket, if you will, on 
the smart water heater that allows any utility or any provider for that matter to plug in a communication device and control it. And many of the use cases are around regulating when the colder water at the bottom of the tank is recharged with, you know, on an average day trying to shift it to nighttime. But on a day where the renewables are going up and down, you can compensate inversely with the water heater by adding load when you want. And so this is not the traditional peak demand response, but the, essentially the real-time demand response. I call them flex loads. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, well, back on the batteries, uh, Bob Rudd, when people hear solar city and storage, I think a lot of people think Tesla. And uh, I know you, you do not work for Tesla, but uh, what, from from Solar City's perspective, what is the uh, Tesla's battery, battery strategy, and of course the the Gigafactory coming on uh, mean for for the industry? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to address that. And, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. I'm I'm not employed by Tesla. I I honestly am not privy to any non-public information on on the Gigafactory related to location, timing, etc. Um, but with that said, uh, we've, uh, you know, we've been working with Tesla for a number of years on the battery front. Um, you know, SolarCity has always been technology agnostic uh, and, and will remain technology agnostic for, for the future. Um, it just so happens that, you know, our chairman of SolarCity is the CEO of Tesla. And, and so to that extent, we've, uh, we've leveraged that relationship to, uh, you know, to the benefit of, of both parties. Um, you know, that process has been about four years in the running, and we've come up with, uh, you know, jointly worked together to develop uh, three uh, battery products, a, a residential, light commercial, and, and sort of industrial battery product. And we're implementing those, you know, across all market segments as, as we speak. Um, you know, our, our focus for the time being is on the large commercial uh, battery product, which will probably be the primary uh, primary product outside of any car batteries that um, that are that are uh, the focus of the Gigafactory. But you know, in, in terms of addressing the question of of you know the Gigafactory and Tesla strategy, you know, I, I guess what I'm what I'm privy to share, you know, is is not earth shattering news. But you know, really, in my opinion, um, you know, Tesla is one of the first uh, you know sort of non uh, battery companies uh, that are really putting their chips on the table in the uh, in the stationary storage space and 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 intending to become you know a, a battery company. Um, you know they're they're leaning forward to get their costs down and letting the market move in tandem so that you know by the time the you know the, the this gigafactory comes online you know, they're able to really be a leader in the industry in terms of cost. Um, you know what this is going to do for the market as a whole. I think it's really going to drive cost reduction uh, across the spectrum. It's going to drive innovation for new products, and ultimately, it's going to allow broader market adoption. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes compare this to where the PV industry was, let's call it six or seven years ago. Um, you know, when a PV panel cost five bucks a watt or more. Uh, you know, since then, uh, capacity across all technologies has ramped up aggressively. It's caused a lot of competition, both on a dollar and an efficiency level. Um, and as a result, efficiencies have come up, costs have come down dramatically, and that's opened up more markets. Um, and, you know, really that's created a feedback loop where we open up more markets, the, the, you know, the, the industry scales, costs keep coming down, and, and you just see that broader adoption. So I think, you know, you'll, you'll see more people uh, making those types of announcements in the future, um, you know, and as, as far as uh, Tesla is concerned, I think they're just uh, really leaning forward and, and uh, placing their chips in a market that we all would probably agree is going to be uh, massive in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, cost coming down is, is key to make uh, mandates like California work. Uh, Bob Fleischman, back to you on, on that California mandate. Um, do you see any other states moving in, in that direction for uh, uh, you know requir requiring utilities to do storage as, as, as they, they would with an RPS? Very important question. California clearly is a driver here, and a number of other states are watching very closely what's going on there. And New York, for example, has a, a range of different policies and initiatives, but they're not in the nature of a mandate. They're trying to create an energy storage marketplace, and uh, how, for example, that the uh, uh, 
uh, modernization of the uh, distribution uh, uh, company proposals will move uh, will be I think an interesting thing to watch and Texas also has a number of initiatives but I don't see the it necessarily being a mandate until it can be uh, proven that California is successful I, in a related vein you know the renewable portfolio standards which are in uh, the nature of a mandate which have been around for many years at the state level 30 or so states have uh, laws or policies uh, in that and RPS is under attack that type of mandates under attack in Ohio uh, with SB 310 uh, which is uh, freezing or, or rolling back the RPS to some extent and you know there's federal uh, district court lawsuit in Colorado with respect to that particular program so uh, mandates with respect to RPS are under attack and uh, I think that uh, people will be watching California very carefully and closely but not racing I don't believe to have mandates uh, but I think the uh, other thing is how will states uh, move forward to implement the uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, proposals with respect to existing power plants that EPA put out proposed rule on energy storage was noted there as one way to mitigate uh, the cost that was in the proposal that EPA put out so the interplay with uh, greenhouse gas regulation assuming it moves forward uh, is going to be another place to watch where uh, the mandate or the incentives for energy storage at the retail level are going to play out yeah I, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, EPA uh, proposed EPA rules uh, Big, big news in, in our industry, of course. Um, Tom, I want to ask you, what, what, what do you think uh, those could mean for, for the storage business? I think it could only mean good things. Um, you know, I'm five years into the storage industry, and one of the things that I didn't appreciate until a year or so into it is that the process of providing electricity, generating transmission, uh, and distributing electricity is pretty wasteful. I came from the semiconductor industry where things were pretty darn optimized. And there is just an awful lot of necessary backup. Uh, there are spinning reserves in case a tree falls and takes out a line or somebody knocks out a transformer in the neighborhood. So we all appreciate that, that backup um, and that redundancy, but it comes at a huge cost of efficiency, a huge cost of, uh, of pollution, right, here in the United States the single largest cause of CO2 is, uh, is the process of making electricity, the power plant. And I think that that's why it was attacked. So if you look at that process and, and you understand, uh, certainly in California, as renewables become a greater part of the picture, that you have to have some additional backups because solar isn't perfect or wind doesn't always blow when you want it to blow. And batteries, by contrast, can provide that same functionality as spin reserve to, which would, would kick in if the cloud comes over your, your solar field. Um, but it can do it in a better, uh, less expensive, cleaner way. So I think if you really analyze the dynamics of delivering electricity to the homes, to the businesses, you'll realize that batteries have a big part of this equation. And I think that the ruling uh, here in the U.S. will help drive that. Um, and as we get more batteries on the grid, uh, you'll see those benefits come through. Very good. Um, so we're starting to uh, get some great questions coming in. And I uh, just want to remind you to uh, type your questions in the uh, question box on your screen. Um, so our first uh, question from the audience, and I'll direct this to Bob Rudd. Um, what are the most cost-effective uh, distributed electricity on-site storage options around five kilowatt scale for homeowners or a bit larger for commercial use? Um, am I allowed to just say ours? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm being facetious. Uh, you know, candidly, I, I wouldn't say that we have um, – you know, much visibility into the cost curves for five kilowatt batteries uh, outside of what we've developed in house, which is um, you know somewhat of a of a disjointed uh, product that is you know a, a battery separated from an inverter um, and uh, from an inverter and then separately having a PV inverter. 
um, and and that's currently going uh, going through a bit of a of a, of a product revamp to, to help bring those costs down. Um, but uh, you know we, we like lithium ion. It, it's like I said, we're we're technology agnostic. So to the extent that you know uh, an alternate chemistry uh, comes online that can compete and and you know both in cost, you know space efficiency scale of being able to go from five kilowatts all the way up to much bigger, we're, we're happy to uh, explore that and we do explore that on a regular basis. Um, you know, but for us right now, our, uh, our platform is a five kilowatt, 10 kilowatt hour battery. So a two hour runtime, which I think may address, uh, you know, part of the question of where we see the sort of optimal economics here. Um, so, you know, that, that's where we see it in the commercial space. And then likewise in the residential space, um, you know, again, we're, we're somewhat preferable to, uh, to, to lithium ion as a, as a technology. Uh, we've got a 30 kilowatt, 60 kilowatt hour uh, battery, which we call sort of our light commercial product. And then, you know, a 200 kilowatt, 400 kilowatt hour uh, super pack, as we call it, which is, which is the sort of uh, industrial. Those are all Tesla batteries as, as, um, as I think we've, we've stated. So uh, in terms of where the economics are, are best, um, you know, that's where we've aligned for the time being. But as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're always open for improvement. One thing that we keep in mind uh, very near and dear to our hearts is that, you know, a lot of these systems we're financing, uh, we're going to own them. We're going to be on the hook for, for the performance over 10 plus years. Um, and so credit of the manufacturer is a big deal to us. Uh, and so, you know, I, we'd be somewhat hesitant to, to do too much with any sort of R&D type technology even if it did come at a much lower cost, uh, just because underwriting it from a financial perspective is, uh, is, is important to us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Conrad, I want to talk about some of the non-battery alternatives uh, technologies for storage. Um, you, you talked about water heaters, which is very interesting. Um, there's ice storage. There's uh, traditional pumped hydro, uh, compressed air lots of different technologies out there. Um, so which, which ones, I'd say, besides batteries and besides water heaters, which you've addressed, uh, you think might be commercially viable in the short to midterm? Um, if, if any. If, if we go to the goal of trying, I mean, the interest in storage really has to do with um, dealing with the variable power of renewables. And so it's not a storage option, but with regard to um, loads, loads for 120 years have you know, responded by just drawing power when the customer wants them. But if you look at modern electronics and modern optimization systems and control, Loads, there's at least 50% of the loads that have some flexibility to run at varying power levels. And there's, up to a lesser extent, loads that can shift when they actually consume the bulk of their energy. And that hasn't been tapped at all. And so um, what I, I've sort of coined a word called allonetic behavior. So allo means to support, net as in the grid. but like almost any HVAC motor with a variable speed drive could actually moderate its power output for short periods uh, in a, a range acceptable by the manufacturer to adjust load in real time. And thermal storage of buildings uh, gives you ability to shift, depends on the comfort parameters, but sometimes as much as several hours. And so I think there's going to be a lot more use of, of building mass plus like an EVs when the customer actually charges their vehicle or in the systems that Bob's contemplating. With a small battery, those systems could respond to grid signals to optimize their, their output or charge depending what's happening with grid dynamics. So I see a lot of very low cost potential in that area. Okay, very good. I um, want to uh, talk for just a couple minutes about what's going on in Europe. Uh, there, there seem to be a lot of growing pains with renewable energy, uh, Germany in particular, 
overproduction without storage during peak generation. Um, and so I, I guess I'll open this to anyone who's keeping an eye on that, but what, what can we learn from what's uh, going on in Europe? Uh, Bob Fleischman, are, have you been keeping an eye on that at all? Not really, no. Okay. Anyone else? This is Tom. I know that residential storage has grown uh, in Germany quite well during 2013. I think the number is 4,000 residential storage units were sold. And I believe the driver for that was the change in the feed-in tariff. Uh, it used to be very rich, um, and they scaled that back. Um, the richness helped put Germany on the map in terms of uh, in terms of solar. It's not uh, exactly a sunny country, but certainly they've led the world for many years up until recently on solar. And the change in the tariffs have encouraged people not to sell back to the grid, but instead to save for themselves using uh, residential storage. And that has uh, has caught on, and I think the expectations for 2014 are even uh, more than the 4,000 units from last year. Mm -hmm. um, we could have uh, a couple of different questions uh, focusing on the residential. So I guess, uh, Bob Rudd, this would be back back to you. Um, what uh, what regulations and codes are there for installing battery storage? Is it, is it pretty easy or, or a challenge? And uh, we have a question. And what what does a battery storage installation at a home or commercial location actually look like? Huh. Okay, um, I'll, I'll address the, uh, the, the the first question. Um, uh, and now that I mentioned that, I spaced on it. So I'm going to address the second question. Then we're going to then we're going to go from there. So, it's just uh, um, regulations and codes. Oh, regulations and codes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, th I think the, mo the most uh, relevant detail, uh, or the most relevant uh, code right now, uh, is is you know that with regards to the interconnection with the IOUs. Um, you know, is, I think part of the question was, is it easy? And uh, you know, my direct answer would be historically far from it. Um, you know, I, it, to those that have followed any of the press related to our uh, residential storage program. You know, we had installed a, a very large number of, uh, of batteries uh, and, and gone through the interconnection proceeding as required by the IOUs. And uh, different IOUs had different uh, somewhat arbitrary requirements for the battery projects that, that, um, that were holding us up for, for, for many months to actually uh, receive permission to operate of the battery system. So uh, there's been a recent ruling at the PUC with regards to interconnecting batteries uh, in conjunction with net metering PV systems, um, and that is, you know, the so sort of new law of the land with regards to uh, to interconnecting uh, batteries with, with in conjunction with PV systems, um, and and that was a huge win for us in terms of you know what it sort of allowed the utilities to do and and not to do um, in terms of you know more localized regulations, fire setbacks, um, indoor versus outdoor ventilation, things like that. Uh, Candidly, there's there's not a lot to, that that covers that. You know, lead acid batteries have been in in buildings for a really long time now, uh, but I don't think that you know these these new chemistries have really been contemplated by a lot of AHJs. Uh, so it varies from from county to county and from AHJ to AHJ. And I see you know going forward a lot of the regulations being revised to more explicitly address this uh, instead of it being more of a one-off permitting process. Um, and then to address the second question, uh, what do these look like? Um, you know, a residential 5 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt hour battery looks similar to, you know, a, let's call it a, a, a large uh, residential or, or light commercial uh, inverter. Um, it's got its, sep its inverter separate as far as our, our system today. Um, so, you know, they're about, let's call them three and a half feet tall, a foot and a half deep, and, and a foot and a half wide, give or take. Um, and they look very similar to... Uh, you know, to any other sort of inverter uh, that you'd otherwise see in PV. Okay, very good. Um, Bob Fleischman, uh, Bob Rudd referred to the PUC ruling in California, which uh, I'm way oversimplifying here, but essentially put a cap on the charges that uh, uh, utilities can uh, can can do for distributed storage. Can you uh, kind of uh, 
give us the, the, the quick legal expertise on that ruling and do you see that, uh, that's, that same type of challenge uh, going on in any other states? But just briefly, uh, you know, in mid-May, the uh, CPUC, the California Public Utility Commission, issued a decision that exempted small storage devices that were paired with net energy metering eligible generation facilities from certain inter interconnection fees. And uh, the exemption for this, uh, I'll call it uh, net energy metering paired storage, uh, would be tested on a provisional basis for systems uh, that were connected uh, by the end of 2015. And uh, there was also a requirement that there be some refunding of interconnection charges uh, uh, with respect to matters before the decision. And, you know, the, I think what it, it raises besides for uh, uh, the question of how storage will be dealt with in connection with interconnection, uh, which is an issue in, in many places, I believe, but also the, the interplay with net metering policies and programs. And, you know, this has become somewhat of a battlefield in, in a number of states. There are a number of states uh, after the Energy Policy Act of 2005 uh, that have in place various types of net metering uh, programs. And uh, one of the big issues there is that in many of the states, um, the, uh, the credit that uh, is authorized by the state is equal to the, the bundled retail uh, rate, the bundled rate, and that is causing uh, a number of concerns by utilities in terms of uh, the erosion of revenues with respect to their own systems. So uh, I see the, uh, the ruling by the California Commission as significant because it deals with interconnection charges associated with storage and also the interplay between storage systems on the one hand and net metering on the other. Mm -hmm. and, and any other states w w that where this kind of thing is, you know, actively uh, being in conflict, shall we say? I, I'm not seeing that at this point, and I think it may okay. have to do more with the relative state of, of, of progress in, in other states as contrasted with California. It's one of those sure. really good, as uh, as energy storage evolves. Right. Um, want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, vehicle to grid, uh, you know, electric vehicles as, as storage devices themselves. And uh, Conrad, I'll d direct this to you. Um, is, is there going to be a real market for these connected vehicles as a storage asset and also for repurposing used uh, batteries from EVs? Uh, well, for me, um, I'm not currently a big fan of vehicle to grid. Uh, as a leaf owner, <laughs> the warranty's you know um, voided if if I start selling power back to the grid. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of a deterrent. Um, but I do see, which I mentioned a little bit before, what I call smart charging. It's a it's not where you take the power and put it on the grid. But just, it takes the same amount of control capability, quite frankly, but it's the ability to choose when the, the, the car actually charges. And this is going to evolve over time, but it requires ultimately the, the, the driver to be able to put in their flexibility. You know, do they have a, an appointment and need a full charge in an hour, or do they just need cheap electricity by the time they go home? And those types of customer issues, if they can be optimized through a control algorithm, can then take grid signals and optimize when the battery gets charged. And that's the sort of flex load concept I'm talking about. And that needs to happen first. There's no barrier to when you charge the car. So being able to do that, it's only a small distance away before you then put energy onto the grid. But I'm I, I'd be thrilled if we could just perfect the use case for uh, when the car charges. Mm -hmm. um, interesting audience question here. Back in 2012, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab wrote about using buildings to firm up variable renewables and said, quote, fast acting automated demand response is more cost effective than grid scale battery storage. 
Uh, so, Tom, I'll, I'll uh, send this one your way because it strikes at the heart of your business model. Um, what uh, What do you think of uh, you know that thought that demand response is a better way to go than uh, than battery storage? Demand response is great. Um, to a certain extent, you don't have to buy an asset. You have an asset already there. You just need to control that asset a bit better. You need to uh, reduce load uh, when you have been asked or demanded to uh, to respond. So that certainly makes sense. I think that what we're seeing with some of the companies with demand response is they've had a nice run, but the ability to keep uh, growing and keep uh, you know, on that forefront of energy management requires some new tools in the toolkit. Uh, and we think that a well-designed commercial and industrial battery, which is typically what the DR companies are focused on, CNI customers, can actually help demand response be even better. It can, for example, help increase the revenue. Uh, where DR gets beaten up, it's not always uh, dispatchable. It's not always there when you want. Um, and if you had a storage asset that maybe was there to do other things when there wasn't a demand response day or afternoon, and it can also be there to help play uh, during the DR days, I think that that can make sense and actually help drive DR even stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else want to jump in on this one? Yeah, this is Bob Fleischman. One additional thing with respect to challenges that demand response providers have on the legal front, within the last month or so, uh, a federal uh, U.S. Court of Appeals uh, vacated part of uh, a FERC rule dealing with demand response compensation in energy markets in RTOs and ISOs, and in the process also raised significant questions about FERC's jurisdiction to uh, uh, impose policies with respect to what they call retail non-sales, which is uh, shorthand for demand response, according to uh, two of the people, two of the judges on that court. So how that is all going to play out, how FERC will deal with this and, and in the courts and elsewhere, uh, has raised a, a question for demand response providers, and, the, and that decision went a little bit far, farther than some had thought. It went beyond the just compensation issues in energy markets uh, to address the uh, jurisdiction of, of FERC to even uh, be a significant player in this market. Mm, very interesting. And this is, uh, I'll just add that yeah. this, this concept is exactly what I mean by allonetic behavior. This more dynamic interchange between loads and, um, and market signals is exactly what um, is, I mean, the barriers are standardized ways to communicate to loads. And that's evolving in the smart grid space very slowly, but it will it will find its day because it is so cheap. But I that I will say the reason we're doing the our Portland State sort of home battery backup system is exactly because there's other value propositions in storage that you can't do with loads, and they have to do with reliability. And so it's going to find a market. Um, as well as the domain. We need both in order to bring renewables on at scale. Mm -hmm. um, Conrad, we're getting lots of questions on water heaters. You really uh, <laughs> it br brought up an interesting one there. Um, so just, just w one pretty basic question, I think. Uh, how are the BTUs stored in water heaters uh, brought back out for utility scale usage? So uh, familiar, if you're familiar with an electric water heater, um, I'll start with resistance, although this can work with heat pumps, and I won't go into that. But there's two heating elements in a tank. The, the top one has priority and always keeps the top tank, uh, top third of the tank hot, subject to just, you know, customers taking continuous showers are going to run out of hot water no matter what. But it's the bottom two-thirds of the tank, which is heated by the lower heating element, that with smart algorithms, that's about six kilowatt hours of energy that it takes to reheat the cold water at the bottom of the tank. And traditionally, the tanks reheat that energy as soon as the sensor detects the cold water is there. 
but if you have a smart water heater that's keeping the top hot, then you can choose, you know, a number of minutes or essentially the, the power level at which the bottom element reheats the water. And if you space that over the day, it means you have the ability, for instance, if I recharge it not at 4,500 watts, but say 500 watts, then all day long I can either cut that to zero, which looks like uh, a generation increase, or I can double its you know, heating ability up to 1,000 watts, and that looks like charging a battery. And so in a control algorithm where I can tr control these con continuously, then I can do inks and decks just like I can do with a battery. And those little water heaters that are everywhere, they're 5 kW of storage, and if I multiply that by the 3.5 million water heaters in the Northwest, I get a huge resource, but for sure, yeah. a cheap way to interconnect. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Rudd, this, this one seems up your alley. Uh, what can the energy storage marketplace learn from the PV industry in terms of new financing structures? And do you see a day when er energy storage can be deployed, and anyone can address this one actually, uh, a day when energy storage can de be deployed at the same cost or less and the energy it's displacing. Sure, um, I can address that uh, at least at a high level. So, I think uh, you know one one piece to, to to keep in mind here is that you know it's not just uh, in terms of addressing the weather we can do it at, at less than the energy that it's stored. Um, you know it, that's going to be a function of cost, uh, material cost, as uh, as much as it is you know cost of capital for a financing structure. Uh, you know, I, I, out there today, there are certainly we're, we're not the only ones that have a sort of finance solution uh, for storage products. You know, it's, it's a very short list of folks that actually have uh, any sort of investment fund in place. Um, you know, but but really, I see there being sort of two paths going forward in terms of financing um, storage. Today, you know, our primary focus is PV systems coupled with uh, or storage coupled with PV systems which necessitates uh, a tax equity fund or a tax equity financing structure that will, uh, you know, that will take batteries into the fund. Um, we have some very unique solutions there, and, and in that uh, instance, I think we do have, uh, you know, something that, that may not really have uh, been developed for the market yet. Um, but as we know, you know, ITC is very likely to go away or at least drop significantly, uh, and so, you know, that, that's more of a stopgap measure. So once you go out of the tax equity world, you know, you're really into the world of equity and, and, and debt and, and who's willing to sort of underwrite the technology. So I see there being a necessity of, of really proving out some of these first business models, both in terms of, you know, financial returns for any sort of investment fund, life cycle of the technology, et cetera, before you're going to get, you know, the traditional debt institutions to underwrite these types of cash flows. Um, certainly you'll be able to find uh, equity folks who are willing to, you know, take a little bit of risk in, in order to make a return. Um, but really, I think the the steps that will be required to really bring down the cost of capital is to be able to uh, to, to really be able to lever uh, these types of uh, investment funds um, with traditional debt institutions, which is going to take technology underwriting and a track record that, that they can look at. So I think we're, you know, in the process of getting there. Um, but but it's a, a, a bit of a ways off uh, in terms of you know a really bringing down that cost of capital for financing these projects in order to uh, in order to you know use that in conjunction with lower cost of batteries to really drive uh, drive adoption. Mm -hmm. um, at Bob Fleischman, how long do you think it will take California to determine whether the storage in initiative storage mandate is successful? Boy, I, I don't know if my crystal ball is that good. Uh, I think that the next two years are going to be critical uh, as uh, the plans move forward. Uh, whether, they're, whether they'll be able to determine within that time frame, I don't know. But uh, how the next two years play out, I think we're going to be critical to, to making that determination. Okay. Um, so uh, stationary energy storage has a lifetime requirement of about 20 years. Uh, lithium ion can typically last uh, about seven under heavy full cycling operation. 
Does this mean they'll need at least one complete replacement over a 20 year life cycle, if not two? And will that drive their costs up? Tom, do you want to tackle that? Sure. I would refer back to my comment on life cycle cost and not to pick on lithium ion because there are certain characteristics that are good and bad of, of any design and any battery uh, type. Um, but you would need to consider replacement, cell replacements um, over time and that may affect, well that certainly will affect the overall life cycle cost. Um, in general, yes, just like our laptops and cell phones, uh, lithium ion tends to lose capacity over time and if you have sold a certain level of capacity for your storage system, you would need to uh, replace the cells uh, if, if that did indeed occur. And that would all affect the total life cycle. Um, other system types, other technologies require other replacements or uh, changes, um, uh, just like you have to take your car in for a tune-up, some of these battery systems have to be tuned up in the field. So that all gets figured into the life cycle cost. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone, can anyone share who they feel is doing the best studies of the cost trajectory of grid and distributed storage? Conrad, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, um, actually, I mean, the research that I do, I like best personally. Uh -huh. One, I haven't actually, on the subject of 20 year lives, I mean, there's a company, if you haven't heard of it, called Aquion Energy, so A Q U I O N, and they have, they used to call it a sodium battery, but now they're just calling it an aqueous ion battery. And it definitely looks like it could have a 20 year life, requires no battery management system. And based on the materials and the design requirements for the battery, which was designed from scratch, um, it, it could easily get below $200 per kWh as a cost. I mean, it's a drawback is the very heavy and large batteries are the same size and weight as lead acid. So, but it, it's totally benign and it requires, there's no required regular maintenance. So um, I'm I'm tracking that as the best proxy for uh, batteries that'll become cost effective for large energy storage applications that are stationary. Okay. And uh, our last question, very quickly, uh, for anyone who knows, besides uh, California and New York, are there any other key state policies? or utility pilot programs uh, currently supporting energy storage development at a, at a reasonable, you know, at a notable scale. Uh, this is Bob Fleischman. I mean, Hawaii uh, is, uh, is focused on this in connection with particularly wind projects. That's another state I would focus on. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, they recently did a, so a 200 megawatt uh, target, I believe. <clears throat> well, um, we have come to the end of what's been a very informative hour, and uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who dialed in uh, to participate today, and especially want to thank uh, all of our panelists, uh, Bob, Bob, Conrad, and Tom. Uh, appreciate your time and your expertise, and our session co-host, Morrison and Forster. Thank you very much.